Do you know what time it is? It's supernatural story time. And if you're easily scared, and even if you're not, there's only one thing left to do. Just turn off the lights, because these are stories that you listen to only in the dark. It was something tall. The events I'm about to describe to you occurred in mid-October of 2012. If you choose to believe them or not believe them, that's on you. However, this is an actual account to the best of my recollection regarding what transpired that night. I had been transferred to Northwestern Maine in August of 2008, and to put it this way, it may as well have been the end of the world. As far as federal agencies go, I doubt there are many who could claim to have been stationed in a more remote location. It was nothing but a small village amidst a seemingly endless amount of mountains and forests. The only real industry to speak of was tourism in the summer and logging. The first two years went by without incident. It was a welcome change to what I had experienced along the southwest border. It was a quiet posting. The most dangerous part of our job was maybe hitting a moose or a deer in our patrol cruiser. Needless to say, complacency started to creep in. Slowly at first, but over the course of a few years, I had let myself go. I stopped working out. I stopped training as hard as I should have. I essentially lost motivation. The only reason I am including this in my account is because it played a crucial part in the event at hand. Being unmarried with no children, I normally volunteered to work the overnight shift to allow my colleagues with families to enjoy some sort of normalcy. The night shift didn't particularly bother me since I didn't have much of a social life to speak of. I had outgrown my fear of the dark many years ago as a child and being in law enforcement, if one has a fear of the dark, you're probably in the wrong line of work. Night shift was extra quiet. Due to the remoteness of our post, radio coverage was spotty at best. Throughout most of our AOR, we went without comms. In any other posting, this would be considered incredibly dangerous, but as I mentioned before, it was quiet. Nothing but trees and mountains as far as you could see. There were no drug cartels up here. This particular night was nothing out of the ordinary. The weather in the mountains was always cooler, but it wasn't unseasonal. The temperature was dropping and a heavy fog that occurs in the mountains almost nightly had set in. I was patrolling a logging road I normally didn't travel on, but out of boredom decided to give it a look. I had been outside of radio communication for the better part of an hour as I continued up this dirt road climbing further into the western mountains. This was four years ago, but to the best of my recollection, it was about three in the morning when I saw it. I had just come around a turn and crossed over a small wooden bridge that seemed to have been built a lifetime ago. Before I continue, I have to stress yet again how quiet this posting was. I had been there two years, and not a one of us had seen or heard of anything going on in our entire AOR, especially this portion of it, mainly due to the sheer remoteness. The only ones who traveled on these roads were us, game wardens and the logger themselves, and even they were sparse as they had been working heavily in another area about 45 minutes away that year. As I said before, the fog was heavy that night, a bit heavier than usual, but the temperature was dropping and that was normal. I turned the corner and that's when I saw what I believed to be a tall male, approximately 10 meters in front of my truck. He was abnormally tall. I'd put him at about 6'8 and lanky. I believed he was dressed all in gray. To this day, I describe it as a gray sweatsuit. And he was running across the dirt road, seemingly from one edge of the tree line and across to the other. You can imagine my surprise. Immediately, I threw my vehicle in park and hit my brights on, but the figure had already made it to the other side and into the trees. My heart was already pounding. Could I have seriously just stumbled onto some sort of smuggler way out here? Someone trying to sneak into the country? Out here? That's the only thing I could come up with, as that's what I was trained and paid to detect anyhow. Without thinking much further on it, I activated the weapon lock in my vehicle, grabbed my rifle, hit the alleyway lights, and took off at a near sprint into the woods after what I assumed to be someone who had crossed the heavily wooded border illegally. My heart was pounding as I made my way into the tree line, smashing through the trees, hopping over down logs, 
and through the brush. My eyes squinted to see the man, but I was coming up empty. The fog was so thick. I ran maybe 20 yards into the woods before forcing myself to stop. I had already made a series of serious mistakes. Rookie mistakes. For one, I left my vehicle running with the keys in it, door wide open. Second, I hadn't even racked around into the rifle, which occupied both of my hands. Third, I had already lost visual of the subject, but continued to sprint after anyway. And lastly, and most importantly, nobody had any idea where I was. As I mentioned before, I was out of radio contact. Had been for about an hour. There was another agent on duty, but he might as well have been on the moon. But there was something else. Something was wrong about this entire situation. Where had this man even come from? If he crossed illegally, where the fuck did he leave from? How did he get here? He didn't have a backpack. And it was easily a two-day hike to the nearest goddamn paved road from a starting point in Canada to where we currently were. I knelt down, listening as I tried to make sense of this. It was quiet. Not a sound. Someone moving through the woods, especially if they are being chased, makes noise. And a lot of it. Why was it so quiet? I tried to control my breathing. More and more was coming back. The reactive part of my brain that had been trained to chase and apprehend was slowly giving way to the logical part that was piecing together that something was very wrong with just about everything I had seen. My subconscious was screaming at me to dig into it, work it out. His running. It wasn't running so much as it was a bound. And it wasn't fast, it was slow. Not slow motion slow, but the way it moved was more of a glide. It went up and down, as if someone were running, but it was almost as if it was simply mimicking what running looks like. I wish I could describe it better, but that's the best I can come up with. Through the fog, I never did see the feet, but as I mentioned previously, the guy was tall and lanky, arms that swayed gently as it bounded across the road. I thought it was a gray sweatsuit, but was it? It's as if the entire guy was made of gray, blending almost into the fog itself. What the fuck did I see? Did I see anything? Did my tired eyes play a trick on me in the midst of this fog? Lack of stimulation? All of this was going through my head as I knelt down, listening for any sound that I wasn't crazy. I decided to pull my shit together and focus on the issue at hand. I had an individual outstanding. I racked around into my M4, flicked the safety on and kept it at high search and carried on, slowly this time taking caution, for all I knew this guy was a threat. He certainly was big enough to be. I went on like this for several minutes, although it seemed like hours. I would take a few steps, pause and listen, nothing. Take a few more steps, kneel, pause and listen, nothing. As I continued further into the woods, the light from my alleyways was barely cutting through the fog. I thumbed on my weapon light and began searching again. Still fucking nothing. My shoulders were starting to burn from holding the rifle up at high search. How could I have let myself go like this? Sweating like a fat fucking slob. Arms aching. Cursing myself for every goddamn cigarette I had smoked since arriving here. Still, I had a job to do. And if there was someone out here, I was going to catch him. Despite the unusual circumstances, I was a firm believer, up until that night, that everything in this physical existence could be explained. I refused to go back to the station empty-handed, and so I pressed on. A little voice in the back of my head was screaming at me. Who runs like that? Who dresses like that? It's below freezing. Why a jogging suit? Where was his gear? Where was his hair? And then it hit me like a fucking brick wall. Where was his face? I stopped dead in my tracks. I took a knee and panic started to set in. That motherfucker didn't have any distinguishing facial features. No eyebrows, no hair, no lips, no nose, no eyes. And that wasn't a goddamn fucking sweatsuit. Even in this light, in these conditions, 
I could have seen a collar. Everything just blended together. The surefire light attached to my rifle began to flicker. My blood went cold. I could barely see a thing through this fog as it was, and now my weapon light was about to shit out on me. I gave it a quick slap and it went dark. I probably hadn't changed the fucking battery since I was stationed in the desert two years prior. Again, I cursed myself for being such a complacent idiot. There's a feeling that folks are capable of getting. It's likely the most unpleasant feeling in the world. It's the feeling that someone is standing right behind you. Someone that means to do you harm. When that light went out, I got that feeling. And even recalling this story and telling you now, I'm getting the shakes. That's how powerful this was. I thumbed the safety off. Hit it all the way to the right to full auto and spun around, ready to pull a trigger on whatever was standing behind me. Nothing. I spun back around. Nothing. Holding my rifle up with one screaming, aching arm, I dug on my duty belt for my handheld flashlight. Fucking about with the button clasp and eventually freeing it from its holster, I clicked it on and the goddamn thing didn't light up. It was one of those rechargeable lights, and having barely left my patrol vehicle in almost two years and not needing it, I had neglected to charge it, and who the fuck knows how long. This was when the panic started to creep its way up. I was in a real bad situation. No comms, no light, an outstanding subject somewhere in the vicinity and that feeling, that fucking feeling in the pit of my stomach. That feeling on the back of my neck, like someone was dangling a grand piano over my head that could snap and fall at any minute. I was being hunted. I had been deliberately led away from my vehicle into the woods. This had been a trap, and I had sprung it without the slightest bit of forethought. Looking back, I have no doubt of that. The voice in my head continued screaming to run to run as fast as I could and get into my truck and spin those fucking tires and haul ass for the hardtop, get within radio comms and call anyone under the sun to come help me. But I didn't. Regardless of my countless fuck-ups that night, I still was trained, and training is a thin line that pushes back panic. I don't know why, but I knew if I broke and ran, I was never leaving that woods alive. Step one, breathe. Keep that weapon at high search. Scan, look, listen. Scan, look, listen. Move, but move slow. Check your six. Move, look, listen, scan. This was all that was going through my head. Despite all of this, one realization did occur to me. The only noise in that woods that night was created by myself. Anyone who has spent any time in the deep woods, even in the late fall, will tell you that the woods is alive. Tonight, it was as still as anything I've ever heard, but I put that away. Scan, look, listen, check your six. Every time I turned around to check behind me, I thought I could see it. I no longer referred to this thing as a man. This wasn't a man. Of that, I was positive. Men don't defy the laws of gravity and the physics. Men don't have limbs that long. Men certainly don't run through a forest and make no noise. The closer I got to my vehicle light, the worse the feeling got. I was so close, and yet I felt that at any second something would grab me and drag me deep into these trees never to be seen again. Again, training took over. Carp mentalize, break it down to steps. One foot forward, scan, look, listen. Next foot forward, scan, look, listen. Check your six. 360 awareness. Don't leave an opening. And then I was back on the dirt road, my vehicle humming in the night air. I cleared the back seat before entering, ensuring nobody got in while I was out. And then I threw my rifle in the passenger seat, got in my truck, did probably the sloppiest three-point turn I've ever done, and began speeding off. I looked in the rear view and I saw it. The same figure bounding across the road behind me, from one tree line to the next. I didn't stop. I focused on the dirt road and getting back to the hard top safely. Even when I made it to the paved road, I still had about an hour drive back to the nearest town. But 
for some reason, when I hit pavement, I felt I was safe. I was no longer in the woods. Pavement meant civilization. I pulled off to the side to breathe. I called in a radio check, which was answered, albeit bro broken, but at least I was somewhat readable. I've told a few folks over the past few years about this. Mostly it just frustrates me. I was never one to believe in ghosts or goblins or whatever the fuck. You get together a bunch of people and it seems everyone has a story about some ghost they saw, or this or that. That really bothered me. I would tell my story and people would say, oh man, yeah, I saw this one time. Spot off a bunch of bullshit. This wasn't a fucking story. This happened. People shouldn't be so quick to just take what I have to say and accept it as if it's almost normal. There was nothing normal about that night. Nothing at all. Many of you will ask yourselves, well, why post it if it's not a story? I'll tell you why. You won't judge me. You won't think I'm crazy. I've had to keep quiet about this since it happened because if I talked about it openly, especially at work, I would be ordered to take a fitness for duty exam on the grounds of being mentally unfit for the job. And how could I blame them? Did I really want to be known as a guy who sees ghosts? Who's afraid of the dark? I kept it to myself, but I never went up that portion of road again and avoided going into those woods whenever possible. There are undoubtedly things in this world that are beyond our comprehension. This is an example of one. I'm not sure what it was that I did see and experience that night, but I am certain that I saw and experienced something. Some have mentioned it might be something called an echo. Others have gone so far as to say October is when the veil that separates our world and the next is the thinnest and that 0300 to 0430 reflects the same. I've since transferred out and now live in along the St. Lawrence River, New York. What happened that night changed me. It turned me from a skeptic of all things supernatural and paranormal to one of acceptance. I would implore you to do one thing. Don't lie about things like this. It only dilutes the credibility of those of us who have actually experienced it. For those of us who have, the last thing we would ever want is to relive it. For those of us who have, a door has been opened and we are now, I believe, more susceptible to being made to see more things that are beyond explanation. Perhaps once that door opens, you can't close it. The Place in the Desert After I graduated from college, I spent a year working for the Fish and Wildlife Service outside of Tucson, Arizona. It was my first introduction to the desert and I was enchanted by the mystery and otherworldliness of that landscape with strange cacti and plants, which reminded me of illustrations in a Dr. Seuss book. But I wasn't meant to stay, not yet. A graduate degree took me back to cloudy, humid New England, where the dense forest seemed to lean upon me like an oppressive force. Life marched forward as it does, and I met a kind, sensitive man named Simon, who worked for a tech startup in Boston. He had deep brown eyes and a heart-shaped port wine birthmark on his left shoulder that I would squeeze when we were together and mumble into his ear, You have my heart. I got a job in environmental consulting after grad school, and we married, bought an old house on the outskirts of Boston, fixed it up, and began a comfortable life together. The desert would have to wait, and I spent time daydreaming about retiring there someday. Our life was shaken when Simon's father and only remaining parent died suddenly of a brain aneurysm. In the midst of this tragedy, Simon's company began negotiations for a sale to a larger tech firm. Simon was against the sale and stood alone against his two best friends that started the company with him. Not having the stamina for a long fight, he took the generous severance package and left the company. With Simon's inheritance from his father and the windfall from the company buyout, we suddenly found ourselves to be quite wealthy. Simon suggested we sell our house and move to the desert to open a bed and breakfast like we had always dreamed. And so, we made plans for our early retirement. It was early January when we packed up a U-Haul and drove out to our new property in Southeast Arizona. The house that would shortly become the buyer's bed and breakfast was situated just five miles outside of a tiny picturesque desert town, complete with charming stucco homes painted in Easter egg colors. 
we wound our way up a long gravel driveway off the main road for about a mile, and our new abode greeted us. It was an echo-conscious construction, built into the side of a hill to keep it cool in the desert summers with a roof made of solar panels. The front view of the house was almost all floor-to-ceiling windows, and the gleaming glass made me think of the Cheshire Cat's grin in Alice in Wonderland. Two men from a moving company were waiting in a van in the driveway when we pulled up. They didn't speak much English, but they knew the drill and grabbed some boxes from the U-Haul. They paused at the threshold to the house and hesitated, eyes wide, and both made a hasty sign of the cross before entering. I turned to Simon. What do you think that was about? I asked. Don't know. Superstition, maybe? The real estate agent said the previous owner, the guy who built this place, committed suicide here. I felt the hairs on my arms bristle like a cat's tail when it startled. You never said anything about a suicide. I traced a finger over the cool stucco surface of the house. Simon shrugged. I really didn't think it would bother you. It was over five years ago, and it didn't even happen in the house. He shot himself in the head over a mile from here in the middle of the desert. I nodded and decided to drop the conversation for now. We walked around the perimeter of our new property while letting the movers do their thing. The hills around the house were dotted with thorny mesquite trees, and we even had a small chicken coop toward the back of the house complete with chickens. Simon said the realty company had someone feed them while they waited for the sale to conclude. We had one rooster that I immediately named Big Tom and four hens that we decided to name later. The movers worked fast. They were in such a hurry to leave that they barely stayed long enough for us to tip them. When we entered the house, we saw that they had stacked almost all of the boxes haphazardly in the main room, which included living room, breakfast nook, dining area, and an impressive chef's kitchen in a tastefully decorated open floor plan area. That's odd, I said, looking at the stack of boxes. We labeled all these. I guess they couldn't make the ten extra steps to the master bedroom or guest room? I shrugged as we both began to inspect the environs of our new desert home. Simon ran his hand over the plush brown leather of the sofa in the living room and emitted a low whistle. Leather sofa, cowhide rugs, rustic pine furniture. This guy Langley must have been loaded. You think he furnished this place himself? I peeked into the room next to the dining area, which had a door that was partially closed. It appeared to be a small study. Maybe, but the desk in here doesn't look like it follows the decor plan of anything else in this place. The main feature of the room was a behemoth of a desk, made of imposing dark wood. Simon joined me in the study and regarded the desk, knocking on the solid wood. I think this is teak wood. It must weigh a ton, he said. I moved behind the desk and began trying drawers at random. The first drawer opened easily to reveal a messy jumble of papers. Looks like the realtors didn't clean out everything here, I said as I started pulling out bunches of papers and laying them out on top of the desk. It was an assortment of maps, old photographs, and newspaper clippings. My organizer's brain immediately started sorting out the similar items and putting them into separate piles in case we wanted to look through them later. Whoa, Simon exclaimed by my side as I was stacking old photographs without really looking at them. What is it? I turned, swept my hair out of my face and saw faded Polaroid, the field landscape a burnished yellow and darker blotches of some large animals dotted throughout. Are those sleeping cows? I asked as Simon held the Polaroid print closer to his face. No, Beth, they're dead cows. Simon pointed to the cow closest to the foreground of the photo. Now that I was really looking, it was clear that this animal had been shot in the head. That's so strange. Why would someone shoot an entire herd of cattle? Simon asked, hand on hip. Maybe they were sick and the rancher didn't want the disease to spread. I'm more curious about why someone would want a photograph. A little macabre, don't you think? I looked at the photo again, at the splayed out limbs of the poor creatures, at once both artful and grotesque in their arrangement, like bloated spiders with spindle skinny legs. I flipped over the photo. On the back, in the upper right corner, there was something cramped, writing in red pen. I squinted to read it. T7SR23WS14 Final Herd 2010 
I started shuffling through the maps I had set aside as Simon peered at the writing. What do you think this means? Is it some kind of code? He asked, confused. I found the map I was looking for and smoothed it out on the desk. Not a code. It's showing township range and section numbers, part of the public land survey system. They use it to divide up land into square mile sections throughout the West. I used to use maps like this all the time when I worked out here. I pointed at the USGS topographic map I had unearthed and stuck my finger on the nearby town as a landmark and traced it up the road towards our property. Look, township runs north to south, ranges run east to west, the sections are in between. If you follow the main road east into the hills where we are, this house is on... I checked the number. Township 7 South, range 24 West, section 13. Simon peered closer at the map. So this picture, if the notes on the back are right, was taken just one section to the west of the house? Yep. I guess there must be a big cow graveyard out there. We left the study to begin unpacking our boxes, resolving to organize the rest of the papers later. The weeks and months to come, I often wondered if only that desk had been cleared out or removed altogether. Maybe things would have turned out differently. The next morning, I woke to find Simon back in the study. His cheeks were flushed, his eyes bright, in the thrall of a new discovery. It made me smile to see his old zeal come back after the past few hard months. He summarized what he had learned while I sipped my coffee and leaned against the giant desk while he paced in front of me. From what I can tell from some of the legal documents, Fitzwilliam Langley moved out here from Virginia in the late 1980s. He made a fortune in the shipping industry, but after 30 years of that, I guess he decided he wanted to retire to a landlocked state and start a cow ranch. He ran a small operation, but ranching in the desert is tough work, and his herd got smaller and smaller each year, until he just kept 50 cows, running them mostly on that section of land in the picture. There's a creek that runs through there, but it looks like droughts dried it up for good in 2008. So he killed himself because he failed at cattle ranching? I shook my head. I don't know, seems pretty extreme. Simon nodded at me as he shuffled through another stack of papers looking for something. Yeah, he was filed as a missing person in early 2011, but the last recorded sighting of him was Thanksgiving 2010. He had a meal at a local restaurant. He was a bachelor, divorced, no kids. The family didn't start looking into his whereabouts until after Christmas of that year. Simon handed me a news clipping with the headline, Missing Local Millionaire Found Dead in Desert. The article summarized how the last person to see Fitzwilliam Langley alive was a waitress at a local restaurant on Thanksgiving night. The waitress claimed he was behaving oddly. Mr. Fitzwilliam barely touched his food and he kept looking at the ceiling and muttering something that sounded like home. An out-of-towner hunting mule dealer had accidentally wandered onto some of Langley's property and found his desiccated body almost two months later. The revolver clutched in the dead man's hand and corresponding hole in the skull told the rest of the story. But that's not all. Simon sounded like an infomercial pitchman now. He was nearly bouncing with energy. This land is famous for more than just a millionaire suicide. This was the site of a big meteor strike in the 1950s. It wasn't too long after the Area 51 stuff broke the news, so a lot of townsfolk thought there might be UFO activity out here. People were flocking to this area from all over, but eventually astrophysicists got involved and dug up the meteorites. They hit the ground with such force that they're mostly buried about six feet under the surface all over this land. Simon spread his hand over another USGS map that had red X's marked all over areas west of the land where our house stood. Simon handed me a crinkly bit of newspaper. Look, Here's an old news article from 1958 which talks about the discovery. The article showed a photograph of a bearded man with a shovel. A hunk of rock the size of a large watermelon rested by his left foot. Earth piled up behind. The man struck a triumphant pose, hands on his hips, chest puffed out. But the expression on his face was not triumphant. It was terrified. Even with the poor quality of the aged photo, I could see that his eyes bulged, 
his mouth twisted into a strained grimace, as if he was in pain, or concentrating on something really hard. The hair on his head and face stuck out at weird angles. My first thought was that he had stuck his finger into an electrical socket, but based on the location of the photo, that seemed unlikely. Salmon was an amateur geologist or rock hound, as others called it. I had been dragged to enough rock and gem show to know what was coming next. I'll get dressed, I sighed, as Simon smiled even wider and darted to gather up our hiking supplies. We set out walking west away from the house. The dry vegetation crunched under our boots as we skirted prickly pear and silver chola cactus along our path. After about 20 minutes of walking, we exited a small grove of mesquite trees and descended a gentle hill into an open space mostly void of trees and shrubs. I stopped and checked the map and compass. I think this might be the location in the photo, I said to Simon. Langley might have physically removed the trees and shrubs around here to make grazing easier. Simon raised a hand to his eyes and pointed. What do you think that is? I looked in the direction he pointed and saw a cluster of juniper trees around a mound of some kind. It almost looks like a grave, I said, and we started walking towards it. As we traversed the field, we started to see fragments of bleached white bone, the remains of the cattle corpses. The arid climate had preserved any bones that weren't carried off by carrion eaters. This must have been a great feast for the coyotes, Simon observed. As we approached the mound, we discovered it was a mass of rough-cut rock and gravel piled about waist-high. Do you think this covers more cow corpses, Simon asked, and I shook my head. It doesn't make sense. Why would they leave all the others out in the open, but bury some of them, unless... I stood back and surveyed the area. The only trees were these junipers growing around the rock pile. A dry wind began to blow and ruffled our hair. I bet Langley dug a pond. You said the creek dried up in 2008, right? Maybe the water became contaminated somehow, so he killed the herd and buried the pond. Simon chewed his lip and nodded. That makes sense. I wonder if Langley unearthed any of the meteorites when he dug this pond. I walked around the pile of rocks as Simon stood musing. I tripped on something and landed hard on my knees and palms, but the sound I heard as I landed was not the dull thud of hitting an earthen surface, but the hollow echo of wood. Simon heard my grunt of pain and came running to lift me up, and I dusted myself off. Did any of the papers you saw mention a door in the ground, I asked, and I pointed at the frayed rope, mostly concealed under dirt that I had tripped on. Simon yacked it open without a word, and we both leaped back as a dark cavern was revealed, with poured cement steps leading down into the earth. Curiouser and curiouser, Simon intoned, as he leaned forward to peer into the space. Well, this was supposed to be an adventure. Let's check it out. I'll go down first and shout up for you if it looks safe. Simon descended the stairs slowly and I waited for a signal. Only a minute or two passed before I saw a glow of light and Simon's call. I went down the stairs and walked into a concrete walled space that looked about 50 feet by 25 feet. Simon had lit several battery powered lamps that were placed on various surfaces. To my left, the wall was taken entirely up by metal shelving, which contained rows of bottled water, canned foods, and medical supplies. To the right was a futon, over which hung another large USGS map with more red X's and writing. At the end of the bunker, straight ahead of me, was a heavy metal door. Pretty intense, huh? Simon asked, glancing around at me. I'll say, I said, looking around at the grim gray walls. I suppose he was one of those paranoid preppers getting ready for the end of the world. I wonder what he thought was coming for him. I plopped down on the futon. My heels rubbed up against something solid and I crouched down on my hands and knees to pull out a long rectangular case. It wasn't locked so I undid the clasp. Inside the plush foam interior lay a gleaming double-barreled shotgun. So there's his arsenal, said Simon. I guess he really was prepared for anything. That must be what all the boxes of shells are for. He indicated a large cardboard box on the bottom of the shell that I had overlooked. We should take this back to the house. This bunker wasn't even locked. I doubt anyone would just be wandering around the desert, but you never know, I said. 
Simon agreed, and our attention turned to the door at the end of the bunker. Did you check that out yet, I asked? Nope, but I wouldn't be surprised if it's hiding more weapons. Why don't you stay back here, just in case it's booby-trapped or something? Simon approached the door and clasped the handle. When he jerked it open, it moved on hinges that shrieked. I looked past Simon's frame that blocked part of my view and saw a space about the size of a small walk-in closet. But no shelves, only something black and shimmery against the back wall. Oh shit. Beth, the whole back wall looks like it's a solid meteorite. Langley must have been digging out this closet space when he hit it. Simon walked forward toward the rock wall, hand outstretched, and I stood up from the futon to join him. But as I took a few steps toward the open doorway, I saw Simon's back go rigid as he touched the meteorite, palm flat against the dull, luminescent rock. Simon? What is it? I asked. He didn't respond. Didn't move either. I could tell something was wrong and I froze, a thrill of sudden fear halting me in my tracks, preventing me from running up to my husband. Simon's body began to shake in quick, jerky spasms. I heard his teeth chatter and snapped shut with a sharp crack. He wasn't able to speak through those clenched teeth, but he sputtered a cry as he turned to face me. G -g 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 -g. He gurgled, and I saw a spray of froth gathering at the corner of his mouth. I grasped. His face was a taut mask, his entire body racked in what looked like a seizure. A light green sheen seemed to be slipping and sliding over his entire body. I gazed closer and realized he was completely covered in some kind of tiny insect so small and so numerous that they blanketed him like a full body cloak. Whatever these creatures were, they were flowing out of the rock to which Simon's hand was still cemented. The loud bang of the door shutting woke me out of my reverie. I was trying so hard to make sense of what was happening to Simon that I don't know whether he pulled the door shut or if it shut of its own accord. The panic rose in my throat like bile right before retching and I launched myself at the door and pounded it with my fist, calling out Simon's name over and over. I could hear him inside, the gurgled utterances. It sounded like the spasms were getting more violent. Just when I had resolved to run out of the bunker and call 911 on my cell phone, Simon went silent. I pressed my ear to the heavy door and held my breath, listening for any sounds from the closet. Simon, I called out, voice quavering at the end. Then I felt the door start to shift under my hands and backed up. Simon stood there, looking almost normal. His eyes were glassy, but he smiled and reached out for me. Beth, I'm okay. That must have been scary to watch. What, what happened? Why did you shut the door? Simon was remarkably nonplussed about what had just happened. I grabbed his arm and searched his skin for the sign of any bite marks. There were none. I closed the door so none of those insects would get out. I didn't want them crawling all over the bunker or getting onto you. I don't know if you know this, but I hate bugs. Always have. I guess I kind of freaked out and I didn't want you to see me that way. Simon smiled sheepishly. An alarm went off in the back of my consciousness somewhere. In five years of marriage and eight years of being together, I had never once heard Simon say he had a fear of bugs. I'd watch them scoop spiders into teacups and usher them outside, so he didn't have to squash them. Simon, it looked like you were being attacked or something. You're sure you're okay? Yep, I'm fine, I swear. I closed the door and slapped all those things off me. They're dead now. Simon's voice had a flat tone to it, as if he was reciting something from memory. I searched his face for anything to contradict what he was saying, but he appeared calm, almost peaceful. Let's grab that shotgun and the shells and head back to the house. There's nothing else down here to see. I nodded. We gathered our things and left. We spent the rest of the day continuing to unpack our boxes. I found it hard to get what had happened out of my mind, but Simon didn't mention it once. I kept stealing furtive glances back at him while we were kept busy around the house. He was doing a lot of staring off into space, in between unpacking and organizing, but other than that he appeared fine, so I decided to drop it. We stopped for the night around 7 p.m. 
and retired to the kitchen for a meal of frozen pizza and a bottle of Pinot Noir. I was still jittery from the incident in the bunker and drank almost the whole bottle by myself. When I look back on that night later, I remember that Simon barely touched the food or wine, but I was intent on relaxing and forgetting the ordeal of earlier that day, and wine helps with both those things. We went to bed early, exchanging few words. I awoke groggy and alone much later. I felt Simon side of the bed and it was cold. I glanced at the clock and it was 4 a.m. I threw on sweats and a t-shirt and tiptoed across the cold top floor on my bare feet to search for Simon. He didn't seem to be anywhere in the house. I felt a chill on my neck and noticed the front door was ajar. I slipped into my clogs and walked out to see if Simon had taken a midnight stroll. The moon was nearly full and bright against a brilliant sky. I peered at the ground and thought I could make out some footprints. I followed those around the house towards the chicken coop. As I stepped closer to the fenced area, I noticed a figure crouched on the ground. It was on all fours, like an animal. But as I closed the distance to the chicken coop, the shimmering moonlight revealed pale human skin, and I saw the outline of a heart-shaped birthmark on the left shoulder. The chickens were scuffling and squawking as if agitated. I swallowed hard and felt the wrongness of the scene swell up my face from my chin to my hairline like a creeping blush. I called out to my husband, my voice strangled sounding and cracking at the end. Honey? Simon? Are, are you okay? Simon went still, then jerkily pivoted on the balls of his feet to glance back at me with hooded eyes. The limp, lifeless body of the rooster I had named Big Tom dangled from his mouth, a pile of feathers on the ground at his feet. I gasped and stepped backwards, nearly tripping over my own feet as Simon released the rooster from his mouth and rose off his haunches. He stood and wiped the blood with the back of his hand, which left a gruesome trail like smeared lipstick. I looked at his face in the moonlight. It was a cruel imitation of the face I knew so well. The skin seemed to undulate, as if a current of static electricity buzzed just under the surface. His short brown hair stuck out at odd angles as if gelled, and his eyes were protuberant and angry. Simon started to grumble and gurgle in the back of his throat. He gazed upward to the brilliant desert sky washed in stars and muttered one word. Home. I felt a hysterical laugh, threatened to burble out of my lips as I had an absurd thought about the movie E.T., and then a memory from earlier this morning hit me like a punch in the gut. Home was what Fitzpatrick Landley was reported to be muttering the last night he was seen. I reached out, an unsteady hand towards my husband, and tried to keep my voice as calm as possible. Simon, come with me back to the house, please. We'll figure this out together, okay? Simon's eyes still gazed upward. His voice was louder now, though he spoke with great effort as if he was a child, learning his first words. We must go home. That's right, Simon. Let's go home. Back to the house. I pleaded, tears starting to prickle my cheeks. Simon's eyes snapped to mine as if hearing me for the first time. You will take! Simon shouted at me and I jumped. Rage seemed to radiate off his body as he seethed and continued to growl in the back of his throat at a premonition that this wasn't going to end well. I turned and started to walk briskly back toward the house, reasoning that if Simon calmed down and followed me, that would be good. But it might be just as well for me to call the police and have them sort this out. About halfway back to the house, I peeked over my shoulder and Simon was still searching the skies. But in a flash, I saw him notice my departure. He lowered his head like a bull, as if to charge. I ran for the house flat out, as fast as I could, not daring to look back, knowing that fear would slow me down. I reached the door to the house and yanked it open, but Simon had caught up with me with unnatural speed and slammed into my back, pushing me into the house where I sprawled on my belly, hitting the palms of my hands hard and biting my tongue which oozed blood onto my lips as I struggled to get my legs free from Simon's grasp. His fingers burrowed into the meat of my legs with a vice-like grip and I yelped in pain as I was roughly flipped over on my back. I saw my husband up close in the light now, his mouth set in a crude grimace as if he were also in pain. 
and struggling against something. The skin on his arms and chest pulsed and bubbled like wax. His hands closed around my throat and started to squeeze. My body went slack. I stopped struggling, using all of my remaining strength to get a message to Simon. Something had invaded him, taken over, but I had to believe that the man I loved was still in there somewhere. S Simon, you are my heart, I gurgled. I closed my eyes, expecting to drift off to unconsciousness and then death. But to my surprise, I felt the grip loosen then disappear altogether. My eyes flew open and I saw Simon on the floor, face taut, veins popping out on his forehead, sweat pouring down. He was fighting something. With a grunt, he pushed me away and I rolled to my side and took deep grating breaths of air like a beached fish. G get away, Simon yelled. I can't stop it for long. It wants you to take it home, but knows you can't, and it's angry, so angry. It's been waiting for too long. I turned back to Simon and saw him contorted, still struggling against a hidden force. Now, Beth, he screeched. I scrabbled up from the floor and launched myself to the nearest room with a door where I could barricade myself, the study. I slammed and locked the door and immediately started looking for backyard egress when I remembered with sickening clarity that this house was built into all of earth. No windows on this side. Cursing myself, I ran behind the giant teakwood desk and crouched to shove it towards the door. In my weakened state, I succeeded in shifting it a couple of inches. I'd never be able to move it across the room fast enough. Simon's control over whatever wanted to kill me had broken and I heard his fist pounding on the door escalate to the crashing sound of him throwing his entire body against the surface like a battering ram. The door wouldn't hold for long. I bent his train against the desk one more time and jerked it forward another couple of inches when I heard the clatter of something heavy and metal against the towel floor, the shotgun from the bunker. Simon's body slams against the door became louder. He was throwing himself at it with such force I began to see gaps between the door and the wall. With trembling hands, I lifted the shotgun and grabbed an open box of shells which I dropped, raining shells all over the floor like pebbles. As I inserted the shells into the shotgun, long ago experience of hunter safety training clicked into place. Just as I slipped the second shell into the shotgun, I heard a great splintering crack as the door gave way. I had no time to think. My instincts took over as I snapped the brake action shotgun shut and raised it up. I don't even remember aiming or pulling the trigger. It seemed to just go off in my hands, the huge sound it made in the enclosed space echoing in my ears. Simon was catapulted backwards into the hallway as I panted, adrenaline wiping my mind clear of thought. I stood with the heavy metal in my hands for a full five minutes before leaving the study. Simon was sprawled flat on his back arms and legs splayed out as if in the act of making a snow angel. He looked almost peaceful except for the two-inch diameter red hole in his chest and a smell of singed flesh. I knelt at Simon's side, silent tears running in rivulets down my cheeks. The electric agitation I had seen under his skin was gone, his skin smooth and still now. As I stared at the crumpled figure that was my husband, I heard a low fizzing sound like when you open a can of soda and a greenish dust bubbled to the surface of his skin. I backed away and resolved not to touch Simon's body again. I was sure that the danger was past, that whatever had infected my husband was dead and gone, but I wasn't taking any chances. The following hours, days, and weeks proceeded much as you might expect. I called the police and was questioned, but the bruises around my neck from when Simon had throttled me were enough to convince them of self-defense. The medical examiners identified the greenish dust coating Simon's body as an unknown inorganic material and classified it as non-toxic. I didn't mention anything about the bunker in the desert or what I saw pour out of the meteorite down there or my suspicions that there was some type of extraterrestrial activity in the area. No one would have believed me, and if they investigated the space rocks buried around the property, they could be in danger. I rented a small bungalow in the center of town for the duration of the investigations and hired the same movers from weeks earlier to pack up my belongings. I never wanted to step foot in that house. When they were done, 
I pulled the head guy Jose aside and in halting Spanish described what I wanted him to do. He just nodded, needing no further explanation. I drove away and drove all through the night to get away from the desert. Once I was settled in with my sister in upstate New York, I saw an email from the real estate agent that had arranged for the sale of the desert home. It described how the night after I had left, someone had set the house on fire. No one would buy that property anytime soon.